I want to go over the zones of the prostate and so that we can see a little bit more detail within the prostate itself. There are four major zones within the prostate. Um, we'll talk about the peripheral zone first. Uh, this is the area of the prostate, the most posterior portion. So when a male patient goes in for a prostate exam and the physician does a rectal exam, this is the area of the prostate that the physician can feel. Um, generally, about 70 to 80 percent of all cancers occur here. Um, that vary, that number varies from book to book, but that's the general consensus. Um, the central zone is the area that wraps around the ejaculatory ducts. And so cancers that occur here can spread into the seminal vesicles, and they tend to be a little bit more malignant and also more aggressive. Um, but fewer cancers occur in the central zone, and that's less than 5%. The transition zone is the area that wraps around the urethra. So when it enlarges, and it often does um, because of BPH, benign prostatic hyperplasia, or because of tumors, then it can cause issues with the flow of urine through the urethra. And so um, this area, the transition zone, about 20% of all cancers occur here. And BPH, the benign prostatic hyperplasia, can occur with the normal aging process or with tumors. So there's several reasons why the prostate could enlarge around the urethra. And then there's the anterior fibromuscular stroma. This is mostly composed of muscle fibers. There isn't much glandular tissue here at all. And so very few, if any, cancers occur here. Let's review the anatomy around the prostate briefly. This is a posterior view of a patient. You'll notice this is Netter's sixth edition, plate 362, not the fifth. This is a urinary bladder, and the ureters come down here. There's a left ureter and the right ureter. The ductus deferens comes around and attaches superiorly to the prostate, both the left and the right. And then the seminal vesicles come around. Here's the left and the right. And then you have the base of the prostate and the apex of the prostate and the cowper's glands. And this also says posterior view, but I feel as if they've taken the prostate off and then tilted the superior edge of it towards us because this green area here is the fibromuscular stroma. You'll see it here and here, and that's the anterior portion of the prostate. And then the peripheral zone here, this brown color, is the posterior portion of the prostate. So this is the posterior part, and this is the anterior part. And so I feel like they've now laid that prostate on its back slightly, peeled it off the bladder and laid it down on its back. And so the anterior muscular stroma is the anterior fibromuscular stroma is the green part. And then the transition zone is that purple area. I've lost my cursor. There it is. Um, the transition zone is the purple area here. And you can see how that transition zone wraps around the urethra, just like that. So it can cause some issues with the, um, with the bladder. And then the central zone here is in blue. And it also wraps around the backside of the urethra, but where it's really wrapping around is the ejaculatory ducts. And so that then the ejaculatory ducts um, go into the ductus or the seminal vesicles, and that's where you'll find some of the tumors. And if we look over at this area here, you get a little better view of each individual portion on its own. So you can see how the transition zone wraps itself around the urethra, and that causes some of the issues with the um, bladder and issues with urination and frequency, all those things. And then the central zone wraps itself around the ejaculatory ducts, which then go into the seminal vesicles. So you can see how those could be affected with tumors or cancers. And the peripheral zone is this thicker area here in the back, and this is, again, the area that can be felt during a rectal prostate exam. And then the anterior fibromuscular stroma is the anterior portion. There it is. I lost my cursor again. And there it is right there in the front. So these are some great views of the prostate. You can see each individual portion um, and see how it kind of relates to one another. Now we're in a sagittal view. And this is the patient's anterior side here and posterior side. And we have a very similar drawing here with the anterior side and the posterior side. Uh, once again, note that this is Netter's 6th edition, plate 362. So again, 6th edition, not the 5th. 
So we have the bladder here in both views, and we have the urethra coming down into the penis here, just like that. And the transition zone wraps around the urethra. And this is where when it enlarges, it can cause some issues there with the bladder. You can see how if the urine was trying to come down here and that transition zone was enlarged, it would cause issues with the urine coming down through the urethra. And the central zone, while it does wrap around the transition zone and you'll see it around the urethra, it doesn't cause nearly as many problems as the transition zone. But the tumors that occur here can cause issues in the ejaculatory, duct, ejaculatory ducts and then into the seminal vesicles. And you can see why here, because it really surrounds the ejaculatory ducts and um, which uh, go into the seminal vesicles attached there. And then the peripheral zone is this area here in the back. You don't see much of it here because here are the ejaculatory ducts here. And so there's just a small area here of the peripheral zone in this drawing. And this is the area. So if a, a physician is doing a rectal exam, they will uh, press up here into the back side of the rectum, into the wall of the rectum, and they'll be able to feel whether there's an enlargement here of the peripheral zone. And then the anterior fibromuscular stroma is out on the anterior edge here. So this is a very good visual and a sagittal view to show you how those zones of the prostate relate to one another. Here are a couple of MRI scans that will help to correlate the drawings that you see in netters to images that you're actually seeing on MRI scans. Um, they're not exactly the same level as the drawing, but you'll start to get an idea of what you're seeing on different images on different axial images and we'll see some coronal and sagittal in just a little bit. So on this first image up here this is the bladder at the top labeled with a B and the rectum is here and they label it EC for endorectal coil and endorectal coil is actually placed inside the rectum and that gives you the brighter signal here um, just in uh, just posterior to the uh, prostate and right now what you're seeing is seminal vesicles this is the seminal vesicles that sit behind the bladder. So we're quite a bit higher up than this image over here. Uh, the second image is lower in the body, um, more inferior. And uh, this T is for the transition zone. There it is. T is for the transition zone. And P is a peripheral zone. And you remember the transition zone surrounds the urethra. So your urethra is sitting right back here, just like it is here. And the peripheral zone is here. And the reason why we're not seeing the central zone is because we're more inferior than where the central zone sits. And in a upcoming image in the coronal, I'll be able to show you that more clearly. Um, you think that they should all be in the same plane all the way down, but there are some areas where you will definitely see the central zone. And then it, it um, narrows as you go further inferior in the patient and then you don't see the central zone on a axial slice um, in the most inferior portion part of the prostate. So this is a, a couple of different slices that are just on either side of where this drawing would be. Now we can compare the sagittal MRI to the sagittal drawing that we have. This drawing here gives you a pseudo 3D view of the prostate. So uh, you would not get all of the prostate in a sagittal image. And here, we're not actually going to see much of the prostate at all. What you do see is the endorectal coil here. So that's inside the rectum. And you can see kind of the outline of the rectum here. And this arrow here is pointing to the ejaculatory ducts. So the ejaculatory, ejaculatory duct is coming down here from the seminal vesicles. These are the seminal vesicles up here that you saw in the last uh, um slide. And so we were doing a slice probably right about through here on that last um, image that we saw, the last or the first axial image on the last slide. So seminal vesicles here, ejaculatory duct here. Right here is where the ejaculatory duct uh, blends in with the pro prostatic urethra. And here is the bladder here and the urethra here. And so that's a pretty good midline view, but you don't see much of the prostate body itself. And so we're going to see that a little bit better on the next coronal image. 
This is a beautiful coronal MRI of the prostate. And we are posterior in the prostate. I would say probably about the level right about here, going across. So you're seeing the central zone here and the peripheral zone here. And you can see why if we had done an axial image right here, or even just a little bit lower than that, you're not gonna see any of the central zone of the prostate at all. You'll only catch a peripheral zone. And because the transition zone and the uh, anterior fibromuscular stroma lie anterior to that, we are not catching either of those here on this coronal. But on the anterior view, even down lower, you will catch some of the transition zone and the fibromuscular stroma, but you might not catch the central zone just because it does not go that far inferior. So, and then here again, you see the seminal vesicles. So this is a really nice MRI. Um, on some of these MRI scans, I didn't mention it before, but some of them will not use an endorectal coil. And I think on the next one where I show you images of um, some cancer uh, areas in the prostate, they probably will not be using the endorectal coil. Um, as the MRI scans have gotten a little bit more advanced and they use a stronger magnetic field, so use a uh, three Tesla rather than the 1.5 they are often able to get really good images of the prostate without using um, that the higher signal coil right next to the prostate that they used to have to use. Um, sometimes that, that endorectal coil would be so bright with the signal that they would not be able to get good images because of the different um, gradients of signal. It was so intense right next to the coil and then not as intense as you went out further away from the coil towards the bladder that it was almost distracting to try to view the images and, and get a good sense of what you were looking at. But um, those have gotten more advanced as have the MRI scanners themselves and they're able to get great images um, with both uh, techniques. This is the last MRI slide that I wanted to show you. And this is the example that I was telling you about earlier where one of the slides was going to be with the endorectal coil and one of them is without. So this one on the left here has an endorectal coil, and this one on the right does not. Normally, you would see a lot brighter signal around the endorectal coil, um, but they may have made some adjustments so that you don't see um, such a bright signal right up next to the coil. It kind of evens out the, the signal through and through and makes it a little bit e uh, easier image to read. So this is a 34-year-old male patient, and this is the central zone or the central gland, uh, as they called it in this particular image. Um, the peripheral zone, sits around the central gland and the central zone. And the peripheral zone is the area that's most posterior in the prostate. And it's the area where the um, physician would be feeling in a rectal exam to see if there is a normal or abnormal gland or if there's anything uh, wrong with the prostate in the peripheral zone. Um, this is a 64 year old patient or maybe 62, excuse me, 62 year old patient. And the central gland has enlarged um, which is probably causing some problems with uh, urination. And you can see where the peripheral zone has um, really decreased in size and become quite pushed back and, and uh, distorted um, compared to the normal peripheral zone here. So that's been pushed back. This is the rectum here and the rectum here. And so I just wanted to show you those images and give you an idea of what uh, normal and abnormal um, glands look like in the prostate. I don't want you to get too nervous about this picture because I'm not going to expect you to know the 16 or 27 regions of interest for the prostate, but I wanted to show you how similar it is to the liver and that they will divide the prostate up into segments or sections. In this case, they call it regions of interest um, for biopsy and surgical purposes. And then I also believe in treatment and planning purposes as well. They use it for that. So you'll see how that they take the prostate and axially, axially, sagittally, and coronally will divide up the prostate into several areas. Um, so here's a, a, a sagittal view of the patient with this being the posterior, this being the anterior, and they have a dividing line here for the coronal division, and there's a coronal line here as well. And then these two axial lines would divide up into three sections. So here's the three sections you're seeing here. Um, this is the base. This is the superior portion of the prostate. So it's a little bit wider here at the top and gets smaller as you go inferiorly. 
This is a nice coronal view where you can see both seminal, seminal vesicles here. And it just gives you a good idea of how they very specifically divide up the prostate so that they can see the area that they're treating and the area where a tumor or cancer might be uh, involved in the prostate so they know exactly where to go to treat this.